All right, everybody, welcome back. Um, and uh, after this session, we're going to have lunch. I know you saw the food coming out out there. They're going to slowly keep putting that together. Uh, so that should be fun. Uh, Ed, welcome. I see you've made it. Excellent, excellent. All right, how was the morning session, guys? Girls? It was all right. We're still awake? Okay, this is a good start. That's why we're going to break for lunch in 40 minutes, just to kind of keep everybody awake. We've asked them to drop the temperature another couple of degrees as well, so that helps keep you guys on your toes. We have another fantastic panel. Um, one of the themes we saw come through this morning and in our London event two weeks ago was a lot of discussion about relevancy. You know, we all know we message our members and our customers and all the rest of it, but about being relevant. Um, and the other thing that we've, come, we've seen come through as a theme in conversation is this sort of bifurcation of, I don't want to say bifurcation of strategies, but it ends up being, in essence, a bifurcation of strategy of, the goals of the loyalty program versus the goals of the, pro, of the, of the brand, the parent brand. You know, who owns the customer? Who's talking to the customer? You know, how do you get the customer to be loyal ultimately to the parent brand you know, with the loyalty program as part of that mix as opposed to, well, they're, lo they're, they're loyal to the program, they don't really care for the brand. You wouldn't really call that success. You know, it's a half goal maybe. You can maybe make some money out of that customer, but it's not really that emotional connection to the brand that gets them to that elevated sense of true loyalty. So this panel here is probably gonna talk about none of that, but the topic at least is about using compelling content to tell your brand story. So hopefully uh, we can bump steer them back to sort of that, that narrative. Um, and uh, Nick Lamming, from Urb, Urban Leopard Adventures, uh, Ventures, sorry, not Adventures, although he has been having lots of adventures. Um, lots of you probably remember him from his Cebu Pacific days or Amia before that. So um, if I can say it, Nick's been around the traps a little bit. But, but what, what, what is interesting about Nick is he's got to see it from so many different perspectives. Um, and uh, let's not hold back on questions if we want to tap into Nick's insights as well. He's not just a pretty moderator. So. Um, uh, we have uh, Gabby Cool from Low Logic uh, is here as well. Um, Gabby's also seen it from many perspectives. Uh, the coalition side, you know, more recently before before Low Logic, Low Logic as well. Uh, Patrick Young, Young from Arivia, um, and Inia Crilly, who uh, before being at Brightline Trains was with Spirit. Um, so two different verticals. So that would be interesting to to gain your insights. Uh, Indiana into that as well to see what you might see, you know, differently or, you know, how, how perhaps your perspective has changed. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Nick um, and uh, let's enjoy the panel. Thanks, David. Uh, good morning, everyone. And um, welcome to this panel. We, we are going to stray a little from the, uh, the core topic, as I'm sure none of you will be surprised about. Uh, and, and we're going to stretch it a, a little on our own to, to really focus on partnerships uh, and how brands are using partnerships or maybe overusing partnerships uh, to deliver on their, their objectives. We, we've seen over the past two years some really interesting situations where airlines were uh, and, and cruise business and hotels were stripped naked. Their, their core product was removed from them. And what you were left with, certainly with, with airlines, was a cargo business. Yes, that, that, that is core. But also this thing called loyalty. And under the, the skin of the loyalty business, it really emerged that they hadn't been so much focused on maybe their, their parent brand, but they'd been diligently preparing themselves as financial services companies. So uh, under the skin, you had large credit card portfolios that were generating enormous sums of money. Uh, and, and these dipped during COVID, but they only dipped and then they came back. So what we saw is that loyalty programs through the partnerships that, that they had, and it wasn't just um, credit card, there were other partnerships that meant that loyalty programs could stay relevant. And those really came to the fore during the past two years. So with that choice to bring partners into your program, there are a, a number of factors to consider. 
And uh, I, I was just thinking about some of the partnerships that I've seen that really shouldn't work. Uh, and an airline really shouldn't have a big automotive insurance business in, in my view of five years ago. But Qantas in Australia does. It has a very big wine business. Um, and is that an overextension of an airline brand? Is it anything to do with an airline brand anymore? Or has it become more one of a, of a database marketing company attached to an airline as an incentive? I think there's also a danger that you become a jack of all trades and a master of none. In the, if you're not an airline anymore, or if you're, you're not focusing on being a, a loyalty program of an airline, then what are you? Are you a credit card business? Are you an insurance business? Are you a wine business? So um, I, I think that the, the loyalty programs have, yes, they've had to diversify, uh, and some have done it very successfully. The, there's also been discussion around personalization and data monetization. And I, I think maybe both of those phrases are a little tired. And certainly data monetization in my world has been used as an excuse for um, not having a strategy. So it's, we'll monetize our data. And, uh, but, but it's also won a lot of uh, favor with uh, getting finance and, uh, and opening, opening budgets up. And we heard earlier on how important it is to drive communications and, and messaging. Um, so that, that's where the, the kind of personalization comes in. So an interesting topic, and I, I think that it's become all, to, all more important over the last two years, as we've seen, not desperation, but we've seen survival mode kick in for many loyalty programs. And, uh, and a reliance on partnerships uh, in order to, to survive. And uh, I think, although she's, uh, she was airline uh, and now trains, but there's an awful lot of similarity between um, what Brightline is doing and, and the world of airlines. And uh, I was reading recently that uh, there, there's an interesting um, extension to the business of getting out of just trains and into transport the other side. So maybe you could tell us a little bit more about that and what drove that and some of the challenges with it. Yeah, of course. So I am with uh, Brightline Trains, just to kind of baseline the conversation because a lot of people don't really know about the brand um, yet. You know, we're new, we opened in 2018. Um, we're based in Florida currently right now, Miami to West Palm Beach with the hopes to expand to Orlando, which makes it a corridor of about 240 miles. So when I heard this concept before I even joined Brightline, being uh, you know, in Florida all my life, basically, I thought it was you know, kind of bizarre that they were coming to Florida, but it's great. You know, I've traveled, and through my travels, I've been able to, you know, to travel on trains, and I think that they're a great infrastructure addition to what's out there already. Um, so, you know, when I, when I joined Brightline, obviously they're in the train business, um, but something that was very unique to Brightline was creating an ecosystem around the train ride and creating this really augmented um, experience. We're not regular train travel. Um, it feels very premium even in our smart, um, you know, economy equivalent uh, coach, right? So. Um, you know, the leather seats, are, our stations are scented, like, uh, you know, nice hotels, uh, boutique hotels. So it's a very elevated experience as it is already. And we were trying to think about um, how to make this experience even better for our riders and to augment that. And that's where um, mobility came into play. We're already doing train where it's not expected in Florida. Um, and we knew that in order to support this vision of mobility in Florida, we would have to create an ecosystem, the infrastructure to support that. So um, just recently, because uh, even though we started operating in 2018, uh, we took a pause because we relied heavily on commuters um, back in March of 2020 when all of us were hit with the pandemic. Uh, so we just resumed service in November of this year. Um, 
and Brightline Plus is kind of the new uh, product, the new sh shiny thing that we're coming back with. So as a, a writer, you're able to, within your booking, uh, with, within our booking funnel, you're able to book your ride to and from our, our stations. And I know that currently right now, we only market the last mile, which is you know from our station to your final destination, but uh, we're gonna be extending and expanding that um, to first and last mile. So what this means is, you know, one of the brand pillars is sustainability and being an eco, uh, eco way of travel compared to, you know, the car. Um, so what this means is that with the mobility services, we're able to pick you up in a Tesla at your home, bring you to our station, and you're able to have this frictionless experience from your door um, to the train, and if you choose to, from the train to the door of your office, basically. And it's really, you know, something that no one really is doing, especially in, in the U.S., um, but we're a really audacious company in the concept, in the original concept of train travel, high-speed train travel in Florida, um, and we thought that this would be a great addition to augment the experience for the writer and it ties in nicely to creating a frictionless experience, an augmented experience uh, through loyalty itself. And, and when you say, we will pick you up from your door and take you to the station, yes. is that really you or is that being serviced through uh, a partner and, and, and how have you structured that to? Yeah, <clears throat> so long term, we're gonna be um, pretty much in-house, but currently uh, we have partnered up with um, a couple of uh, providers, basically uh, car service providers that we have this partnership with. It's uh, partially, you know, organic and, and some through partnership um, where they provide the drivers, the, the cars, um, branded as, as us and feels like us. Our cars are scented just like our stations. Um, and then also, uh, you know, the car insurance liability that comes with all of that too. So I think that that's a, a good example of a very tightly integrated and, and logical mm -hmm. extension to the to the business, and it, it, it's been important for organisations and loyalty programs to get deeper into people's lifestyles. And uh, w one way of doing that is by airlines selling other products or uh, cruise companies selling other products, or hotels selling other products. And I think we've seen a lot of that, uh, especially from airlines, where AirAsia, for example, I in Asia, have said that they want to be the, the supermarket, the Amazon of, of travel. And uh, facilitating that is, is a big challenge. And I think that's an area that um, that you can maybe tell us a little bit more about, Patrick. Sure, sure, yeah, I could talk uh, about that and, and how Arivia uh, works into that. So um, Arivia is a B2B uh, rewards and travel platform. Um, we worked pretty much strictly through B2B partnerships. Uh, we don't uh, compete on the open internet with, with, uh, with your customers. So we want to be the company that helps put a loyalty or membership uh, group organization into the travel business. Uh, we have a full service uh, loyalty program um, from uh, call centers to online uh, travel um, bookings and then all the way through uh, redemption and earning of points uh, for some of our partners. Um, we are different in that we have a lot of exclusive content or um, uh, specific content to uh, the partners that we have in the travel business. So uh, we curate a lot of uh, very exclusive and um, um, special type things, whether it's cruises um, or um, maybe something that's very specific to, the, uh, to a resort type um, experience for customers. Uh, so we, that's one of the ways that we're really trying to differentiate and provide um, a different loyalty experience than maybe some of our um, our competitors uh, that we might call um, you know larger or or that have a different type of model. Uh, so trying to curate uh, through our platform specific experiences for our partners' customers is really what we're what we're, what we're trying to do. And uh, I, I want to sort of draw out a point here is that. What I find quite interesting is that 
partnerships is a little bit like herding cats sometimes, in that they may have very different objectives to you. And uh, we, we've seen two examples where they're very much white label, so there's no brand clash or brand argument. That there's no argument about whose customer are these. Um, but certainly in uh, some of the challenges that I've seen is where you've got two very large organizations with very large brands and very large ambition to create a database of customers and then monetize that, that asset. So I think that's one of the, the big challenges. Um, and also, I've seen it happen by stealth, where the supermarket says, yes, uh, Bank X, we'd love you to run a co-brand card for us. And they come in and they run the co-brand, and then at the end of it they say, thank you, we've got our banking license now, and uh, we don't need you anymore, and we've got a wonderful customer base, and now we're going to become the biggest bank uh, or the biggest card issuer in the market. So th there is huge challenge when you're bringing, when you're using your brand um, to, to work with others. But I also think it's an essential part of, of loyalty programs because, again, during this last two years, we've seen a big dip in our traditional markets, uh, and especially in the, in the travel sector, it's really struggled. But what we've seen on the other side of the fence is huge growth from e-commerce businesses. So whether it's Amazon or in Asia we have Lazada or Uber and I, I think a lot of the travel businesses have been looking at well how do how do we access this market? How, how do we bring that into our program? We heard from um, Maria earlier about the Uber relationship um, and I remember when, when I was running the, the program in Philippines, uh, I was approached by the, um, it, it, the, the company's name is Lazada, it's the Amazon equivalent in, in Asia. And uh, the country head came to me and he said, you've got the best database of my customers in the country, how can we work together? Um, but actually constructing that relationship and coming up with a partnership that worked when you had those two competing brands was a real challenge and, and facilitating it was a challenge as well because from Lazada's perspective they would put us in their affiliate program which meant that it was great. We got a commission for every sale that we put via Lazada. Uh, and it was a healthy commission and we were able to give points and incentivize it and it worked well. But there were some really big challenges in there because the, the one big challenge was in the asterisks where it said when you've made your purchase after you've come through our, our site or our app then it's 60 days before you'll get your points. And the reason for that was it was 60 days before we were paid our commission. So it, it was a really challenging model to make work and uh, it's an area that I know Gabby and the team at, at Loy Logic have been spending a lot of time on and I, I think you can probably shed a bit more light on some, maybe some of the solutions to those challenges that I, I highlighted. Yeah, thanks Nick. Yeah, so it's interesting, like if, we, if I would take a step back kind of looking at our, our industry um, for either the frequent flyer programs or the hotel programs, if you look at kind of where do we where can we stimulate accrual into the into the into the machine, right? It's not so many options left anymore. You got the co-brand cards, travel under pressure, so probably less being earned by on, on the core product. But e-commerce is booming. And so how do you tap into that as, as a program to maybe make a very significant um, entry into that space? And so if you look at the US market alone, I think there's about 12 billion dollar per year is the affiliate marketing market and we as industry we get like a sliver of that but we're basically non-players in that affiliate marketing and a little bit down to the example that, that Nick gave the user journey is broken as we, we as we have it right now you start on a program page you click on a on a merchant site then you go to that merchant you shop then you have to wait six weeks before you get your points sometimes it doesn't work because the cookie didn't fully kind of uh, transfer through so it's, it's an unnatural buying behavior. No, all of us as consumers, we don't shop that way, right? We go directly to 
a site, we want to transact, and then basically um, yeah, we, we make a purchase there. So when we started thinking on, already for now five plus years, I'm like, can we change that? Can we be classified as an affiliate marketing player, as, as a program, by simply being embedded in the payment checkout of, uh, of such a merchant? So you go directly to a merchant site, they, you shop as normal, and then when, you, when it's time to pay, you see Visa, MasterCard, PayPal, Klarna, Afterpay, whatever it is. Could there be a program branded button in there where you click on it and then either you pay with points or you get points or you make it, you need to become like the fun default experience that people willingly click on. And at the same time, convince that merchant that yes, they went direct to your site, but don't forget this was still an affiliate marketing play because we promoted the fact that we are partners in our environment. We made sure that we as a loyalty program are seen as kind of, these are our core partners, go shop that direct, but we don't want to make your life difficult and force you through the journey. Go direct and basically still be counted in there. So we've tested this now in a couple of markets. We tested it in the Middle Eastern market with a bunch of programs there, including Etihad, tested with Miles and more in the Swiss market. And basically we see that this model works. So merchants are willing to accept that this is an affiliate marketing play, which means you get 10 to 15% type commission, depending on, um, sometimes a bit lower if, if it's electronics, but still you get very good commissions. Um, but it means for the program, to your point earlier, like are we like in the financial service industry? The answer is probably yes, that might be not a bad idea. If you can think of, your, if your members know that your program equals also the fact that you're a payment company in there, that can be super compelling and super rewarding. Um, so in our view, programs should be able to generate two, five, ten billion dollar of e-commerce via their payment button directly in the checkout of selected merchants, not just for payment with points, that's of course one part of the solution, but more interesting enough, if, if, it's, if it's an everyday partnership play, it needs to be about accrual, because you can only spend your points two, three times per year. So if, you, if it's about redemption, it, it's not the right angle. If you want to be in daily life, it has to be about accrual. And then, um, basically, but, the, but the, it cannot only be about accrual, because the, the merchants, why they are, are willing to get you into their environment, that you're sitting on this wonderful liability that everybody always talks about, the, the hundreds and gazillions of dollars of, 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 of liability that sits in there, that is not lost on the merchant. So they like, of course, that part in there. But in reality, maybe 5% of the transaction will be paid in points, the other part in cash. And then you need to think, of how do you bring your co-brand partners maybe into that user experience? So when people click on that button and one part they pay in points, the other part they play, pay in cash, how do you then promote kind of your co-brand partner? Um, they're very, so either don't forget to use your card, or if you pay with a non-co-brand, how do you automate immediately after the transaction has been completed to send a co-brand card offer like, oh, by the way, you could get another 30,000 miles to sign up and you could have earned so many kind of points uh, in there. And we had a very interesting discussion, like we're mostly focusing still on, on Europe and Middle East. We're basically very curious about also, of course, the North American market here. We're, we're debating internally like, should it be one button that you bring to the merchants because they don't want to implement 10 different program buttons in a market like North America. Um, whereas in, in Europe we will go more program branded buttons because there's a big halo effect of these, these kind of brands that are very well known in their home market. So it's, it's, and then you also get the heart and soul of that airline program or, or, airline or, or hotel program into promoting this to their members. So we think it's actually the right solution, but we're not really sure yet in a market where there's so many strong loyalty programs like North America, if, if then 10 buttons is the right approach, will a merchant willingly accept all these kind of buttons there, or do we need to create one kind of button, which we did right now, but we're, not, we're debating that. Back to the, the last point on that co-brand partner. So last week in, in Europe, we spoke to one of the biggest financial service institutions who has got a lot of co-brands with a major airline there. And, and he was telling me that they spent about $20 million <laughs> on online display advertising to promote their co-branded card. And so they pay that money to Facebook, Google, etc., but not to the airline. So the airline is not structured to basically give them the marketing exposure that they need and crave for their, their, their card. And so this, but he said like, if they would give it to me that kind of exposure, I would shift that $20 million tomorrow in a heartbeat to the airline because why pay all these social media companies? So there is a lot of money on the table there but it requires strategic thinking on how do you leverage your program to become maybe more 
a payment type company and then you can be in a daily life without having that brand conflict people go directly to that side of the uh, of that particular partner um, yeah so we we're very passionate about this particular topic we think there's a ton a ton a ton of business to be generated and we also don't think it conflicts with the brand positioning of an airline program because in the end the most desired reward is still the free flight is still the free hotel room so let people collect on their daily purchases on, on these kind of categories and then let that money flow to a very large extent back also to the, um, yeah, to the, the, the core reward offering. Anyway, that's a bit of where our head is. And, and just, just pulling it back to the brand story so that I can get some of the topic in there, David. Um, one of the, the, the big concerns that I always had, and I'm sure it's shared by, by yourself, is, is you are extending not just your brand story, but also the, the service that's associated with your brand. And, and what happens when the car doesn't turn up? Or what happens when there's a, a problem with the, the part of the booking that, that sits with you? And it's my brand that's gonna take the pain. So how do you, how do you manage through that? Well, you know, using the mobility services as an example, um, I think that before you, you know, even think about this type of partnership or product or service, you think about how you can create the most perfect type of service. So it, it's, you know, really important that it's strategic, that there's obviously, uh, you know, um, some level of control from the brand, um, but also the type of partnership that you um, select has to be completely vetted. You know, you have to rely on your partners to be able to fulfill this service um, on behalf of you for your customers. So, um, you know, I think that that's where the foundation lies and everything, of course, is a balance after. Yeah, I would add to that and say, um, you know, from our standpoint, we want to be the brand behind the brand. So we want to make sure that, that as the brand behind the membership or loyalty groups, um, uh, perception there is that they're getting a great value and value maybe is a little bit overused as a, as a concept but uh, and it can mean different things to different people but we want to make sure whether that value means they're having the content that they need whether that's curated or whether that's a lot of different content choice in the travel space uh, and then the uh, another piece of that might be the way that they pay for that. So it could be uh, a number of different ways that they look to either play with pay with some sort of redemption or cash or however they do that. Um, we want to make sure that the customer experience that our partners are getting, uh, our, our customers are getting through their partners is, uh, is, is the best that it can possibly be. Um, that's kind of the way we differentiate as well. So from the sounds of it, the, these partnerships and this extension to the brand, they certainly come with a health warning. Uh, and you need to be cautious when you're uh, looking at the, the fantastic margins in the insurance business or the, the wine business as to whether it, it, A, it's a natural extension, B, whether it's going to be worthwhile financially because there is going to be some pain uh, associated with it, um, is what I'm hearing. I think, Nick, I think it's also kind of the point, like, probably as an airline, like Qantas Wine is a good example, right? maybe it's kind of too far to basically become a wine business operator. I think that's not that natural per se, right? But I think, you know, if you're part of the payment experience and your miles are kind of somehow transacted, it's a, diff it's a little bit more at a distance, right? So I think it's, in that sense, probably a safer choice almost to, uh, and to venture into like all these, running these businesses, that might be a bit of a stretch. And that, that, so that's a different perspective in that you're, what you're doing there is you're saying that my currency can be used to transact and influence people and I expect to be compensated for that, but you're not getting so deep into the business, which is different to the approach that you've taken where it's so naturally a part of your core business that you're willing to, to wrap it all up together. Yeah, there's a risk, you know, in doing that. And obviously, you know, having um, the support of the, the partner is really important, like I mentioned. Um, but at, at Brightline, we're pretty selective about, or at least, the strategy is right now, we're still very new, that the strategy in space previously, 
you know, um, weren't, at least we weren't that selective, you know, and it, it also had to play, um, had to do to the fact that I was with a different type of airline as well, too. Um, but when you have this product that you're guarding and making sure that it's all, you know, right from door to door, then you get to be a lot more selective. And it's nice to be able to do that because then you have a product that's loved by your customer base and then loyalty just becomes a natural thing that occurs. Yeah, uh, again, I, I echo that from my, my days running the, the program where what we were, what we were really looking for is, uh, were partners that delivered on at least one of these criteria. So either revenue, in that they were going to make us a lot of money, so insurance would fit into that category, co-branded credit cards would fit into that category, or uh, brand value. So Uber and Starbucks may not be a big revenue driver, uh, but they're, they're a wonderful addition to the customer value proposition because of association with a great brand. Uh, and they also deliver every day. Uh, I think that was another important characteristic in that, especially with uh, the leisure traffic, uh, with airlines and, and Brightline, is that you need that everyday utility to make your program relevant. And something like Starbucks um, or, or a credit card does give you that, um, that, that everyday utility that, that you need. Or the final criteria was data. And uh, I always put telco in this bucket because I don't, I don't know if there are any telcos here, but telcos are not a great addition to a loyalty program generally because um, they have huge customer base. Uh, they have tiny, tiny transaction uh, amounts and not much loyalty either to the network itself with all of these uh, over the top. But what they can deliver is great data if they let you in. So if you're able to do a partnership with a telco that revolves around data, then I think that that's the best basis for it. And, and that's how I would select that type of partner. So being selective uh, or having the opportunity to be selective and having criteria to measure that partner relationship before you jump into it, uh, I think would be a, uh, a worthy piece of advice. Um, one, one other thing too that I think that uh, kind of goes with that is to be able to do some customization of the program for the part to, that matches the partner. So to work with the distribution partner to make sure the right, from a travel standpoint, uh, which is where I work in, at Arivia, to be able to put together the right curated content that their customers should see. Not, may, they may not necessarily need to see everything that's there, but what is the right thing for them? And it could mean a particular um, product or a, a vertical of travel, like either cruise or air or something like that, or it could be something um, more uh, along the lines of the type or the, the level of hotel or the resort that they, are, that they see. So working together to make sure that's the right thing for your customers can, I think, help create that more loyalty and engagement from the, from the customer, the end customer. Good yeah. point. I think the look, maybe I'm coming at it way too economical, right? So maybe I kind of uh, less less emotional on 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 the kind of on, on the brand fit, which of course I understand that kind of is a very important consideration. I'm just looking at the if you look at the the big income comes from the co-brand cards right now, and we Mark talked about it earlier in the previous panel. It's not without risk, right? It it could become under threat if interchange goes down here in Europe. We've already seen that. And then kind of the airlines, they rely a lot on these valuations and kind of the, the, the finance in there. So you see these buy now, pay, pay later kind of schemes coming in there, Klarna, Afterpay, et cetera. These guys have bought their way into, like I know Klarna paid literally four or five million dollars every time when they wanted to get their payment button on like leading merchants. So these guys have bought their way literally into these payment experience. And now they're all launching loyalty propositions. So basically it's, quite possible that some of the high spenders on co-brands basically migrate to these buy now pay later kind of offerings where there's also good loyalty propositions and the income doesn't only rely on interchange they basically also make other kind of income in there and then suddenly you find yourself as an airline program at risk of, of seeing evaporation of your bread and butter income from these kind of cards so that's why maybe I'm a little bit more looking at kind of follow the money kind of in here for these kind of 
size programs um, one as an opportunity but also even as a defensive move yeah and uh, I, I, so I spent a lot of my career in markets where we had really healthy interchange maybe uh, Australia was an exception I, I went through the inter interchange regulation uh, in, in Australia and, and that it didn't devastate the loyalty industry because you can see how well Qantas have done since but it certainly changed it uh, it changed it enormously and uh, because that, that was the way that most loyalty programs were funded because interchange revenue is linked linked to sales. Um, and when I went to the Philippines, I thought, fantastic, I'm going to launch a, a frequent flyer program and then I'm going to attach a credit card to it and I'm going to go play golf. And uh, I, unfortunately, I got there and I had the, uh, another issue, which was there isn't much of a credit card market in the Philippines. So suddenly I was faced with how am I going to generate all of these massive revenues that my uh, investor expects from the loyalty program. So we had to get creative uh, and I think there's, there's a, a, a warning in that in that there, it would be very easy to get complacent and say that we, are, we only need to tinker with our loyalty program because uh, we've got this mainstay of of credit cards and and the income from it and we don't really need to worry about uh, revenue from other sources but what I would say is that just like COVID came along and, and shook up the whole industry when it came down to whether it was technology to do contactless uh, check-ins we heard about earlier on all of these things were probably three below the, the threshold um, previously, but COVID suddenly meant that they were catapulted into the limelight. The same could happen with partnerships and doing better partner deals and being bolder and expanding this, um, your brand in terms of what it can do and the revenue streams that, that, that come from a loyalty program. So there wasn't much of a question in that, but uh, <laughs> it was more of a, of a warning. And uh, maybe I can, we've got a few minutes left. Uh, are, are there any questions from the floor? I have a question. Yeah. You mentioned... Um, uh, Three, who, who are you? I'm Vanessa Hall. Um, I'm also with the Rivia, but this is a question about um, your comment about Air Asia. Really good example of an airline that's more of a lifestyle brand versus being an airline. Um, and I'm just thinking about, will there be more carriers, especially within the sort of LCC or new LCC model, that look at not being necessarily recognised as an airline, but more as a lifestyle brand? Yeah, I've got quite a long answer to that one, but I'll, I'll try and keep it short. Yeah, yeah. Um, so LCCs and loyalty programs don't mix very well in the traditional model, where it's looking after your best customers because that's a cost. So LCCs have generally had to go into it with a view of how much revenue can I generate by monetizing a database once I've created it. And what AirAsia have done is essentially that. They've created a database and then they've said, right, how, A, how can we monetize it through uh, or, or build our revenues by acting as a distribution channel for all travel products, uh, banking products, wh wh whatever they can, they can do. And they're also doing food delivery and everything else through their, through their app. And then how do we monetize it? And what they've got their eye on are these enormous valuations that whether it's Uber or, or Grab and, and these other organizations around the world are, are generating from being a, a, essentially a database monetization business or a digital database monetization business. And so they, the LCCs are, are looking at that model to see whether they can create big value from their loyalty programs that answer the analyst's question of how can you afford to do a loyalty program? Well, because it's become an asset that's as, as valuable as the airline itself. It's got revenue streams that are independent and not reliant on the old price. And uh, so I think we will see more of it uh, and, and loyalty programs as a business in their own right. But again, it comes with a health warning because I think you've only got to look at Aeroplan and Amia to, to see where it went wrong, where they forgot about the, um, the parent airline. 
and suddenly it all became about building the loyalty business and the Lord and the airline said well hang on you wouldn't be here if it wasn't for us so let's get the balance back so again it comes with a health warning